Michael, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar organized by IDB Invest on how to invest sustainably in Latin America and the Caribbean post-COVID. I'm Michael Stott, the Latin America editor of the Financial Times, and I've been writing about the region on and off since 1990, living in, in three of the countries, and I've also spent time living in other parts of the world, in Russia, Japan, Middle East, uh, Europe, and so on. Um, so I, I wanted to give you some announcements before we start, very briefly, uh, because we have one hour for this seminar. We want to go fairly briskly so that we can get into the meat of it quickly. So we have around a thousand people connected today, so thank you to everybody for joining. But that means, of course, we'll keep microphones and cameras of participants off during the session uh, to optimize the quality of the experience for everybody who's on. Uh, we can offer you translation into Spanish and Portuguese, and you click on the world icon in the lower part of your screen to access it. And most importantly of all, we've set aside some questions, some time at the end for questions. Uh, from you in the audience and please feel free to submit those questions using the zoom question and answer option uh, which you'll find on your screens and of course you can also like questions to push them up to the, top of the list to improve their chances of getting asked so feel free to put your questions in at any point in the seminar you don't need to wait until the end to do that of course <clears throat> so now to the topic of the seminar sustainable investment um, Latin America and the Caribbean as I'm sure you all know, is one of the hardest hit regions by the COVID-19 health and economic crisis. The World Health Organization has described it as the epicenter of COVID, and it's, it's uh, suffered rough 43% of global daily deaths for the last three months. Um, capital inflows as a result have slowed significantly. The economies of the region have been seriously hit, among the worst hit in the world, some of them. But of course, every crisis brings opportunities. And it's the opportunities we want to focus on in, in this session uh, about sustainable investment. Sustainable investment, of course, has become a huge buzzword around the world, hotly debated, hotly followed, lots of people getting involved in it. Very active discussion about its profitability, controversy there too, which I'm sure our panelists will get into. Does it make you more money as an investor if you go for sustainable investing or less money, or does it make no difference? There are arguments all over the place on that one. Um, and uh, I think also what's in no doubt though is that Latin America is a region that absolutely needs to build back better. It is a huge need for investment uh, after this crisis. All of the leaders in business and politics that I've spoken to in the region over the past months uh, are united in agreeing that, that uh, building back better for Latin America is not a nice aspiration, it's an absolute necessity. So we're going to explore in the webinar some of these investment trends for sustainable investment and looking at what makes Latin America and the Caribbean uh, a good opportunity for sustainable investment and how you can make a difference with that investment. And to do that, we've got three excellent speakers I'd like to quickly introduce you to now. Uh, firstly, we have uh, James Scriven, who is the CEO of IDB Invest the Inter-American Development Bank's private sector arm with more than $12 billion in assets under management and clients in 22 countries. Uh, IDB Invest is focused on serving clients and achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, Mr. Scriven is an Argentine-British dual citizen and has previously served as Vice President of Corporate Risk and Sustainability at the International Finance Corporation and prior to that as CFO of Banco Hipotecario in Argentina. Uh, our second panelist I'd like to introduce you to is uh, joining us from Brazil uh, and uh, is now running uh, one of the most important companies in Brazil uh, in terms of uh, impact, which is uh, BRK Ambiental, the largest private company operating in the sanitation business in Brazil. Her name is Teresa Cristina Quirino Vinalia, uh, and she has held leadership positions in multinational companies in the areas of telecommunication, energy infrastructure uh, for more than 25 years. Um, and prior to her role at BRK Ambiental, she served in the AES group and has also worked at NEC in Brazil and at Nextel Telecoms. She's the UN Global Compact Spokesperson for Water and Sanitation and a member of the Leaders Council of the Brazilian Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, our third speaker, 
is, uh, is Scott Mather from uh, PIMCO, and he's the CIO for US Core Strategies at PIMCO and a managing director in the Newport Beach office, uh, a member of PIMCO's investment committee, uh, and he oversees ESG portfolio integration in the US. And prior to that, he was head of global portfolio management, and before that, portfolio management in, in Europe. Um, and previously, he co-headed PIMCO's mortgage and asset-backed securities team, and he's been with PIMCO since 1998. Before that, he was a fixed income trader at Goldman Sachs, uh, 26 years of investment experience, so amply qualified to uh, discuss ESG topics. Um, so those are our panelists. I think we're very fortunate to have uh, you all with us. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and I'd like to kick off with a few questions. My first question would be for James Scriven at IDB Invest. Um, James, let's start with the name of this webinar, How to Invest Sustainably. Investors are using different terms, impact investing, sustainable investing, ESG investing. How do you understand this and, and how do we go about achieving it? Thank you very much, Michael. And, and it's a real pleasure uh, having a conversation with you and especially also with very close partners as Scott and Pim Conteres and in BKRA Ambiental. Um, that, that is a very good question because I think it, it, it requires that we look back a minute and think about the evolution of impacting investing or sustainable investments. I think this started traditionally more than 15, 20 years ago when everything was around, let's avoid risks. How can we avoid creating harm? How can we avoid uh, taking additional financial and not financial risk? And I think that has evolved over time with the creation of the sustainable development goals, with the creation of the IFC performance standards and all, and moving away from this avoidance to intentional mentality. Let's look for intentional impact. Let's look for intentional development impact. And that evolution is, a, I think, a, a very useful one, a very important one that all development institutions have lived through in the last decade or so. I think this helps us, and I'm saying it in particular for us, when you have to take investments, and I know it's the case for Scott and many other investors in the world, that we have to look at the financial sustainability, but also the broader sense of sustainability. If you're investing in 15-year, 20-year investments, you don't only want it to say, am I going to get the money back when I invest at a specific return? But there are many aspects that have an impact. The engagement with the society, what impact does climate have over what you're building? And there are a number of areas that one has to contemplate to look at this. But in particular, what you want to create is value added to this. So I would say moving away from that avoidance mentality to a proactive intentional mentality is a big, is a big concept. But for that, you need some form of management, a measurement. And I know this because I've been working in this business of impacting investors for over 20 years. And only recently, institutions have been able to harness an impact measurement. Historically, they have been talking about development impact, additionality, how to add value to what we're doing, but it never was measured. And I think we, together with a number of other institutions, took the lead to start measuring impact in a specific way. And with that is the launch of a, an indicator that we'll be talking to a bit later. But I think it's important that, you, that we look at it because if you're flying a plane, you wanna have all the monitors, you wanna have everything up and not only the credit risk aspects, but also the impact related. So having much more clarity, clear, uh, clarity credibility, and comparability of these indicators are, are are most important. I also want to talk about not only looking at ex ante indicators, because I think most of the institutions around the world are looking at if I invest over here, this is the impact I will achieve. And I think we at IDB Invest have made a, a very important step to only not only look at ex ante, but more importantly, exposed impact in investing, what has happened on the ground, both a self-assessment and an institution or department within the IDB group that assesses this. Why is this important for this region? Uh, we talked, I just talked about sustainability, but let me relate to this region. I know this region has the characteristics or the mindset of being a middle income region. And I do think that given a number of areas that I will focus on, 
we have been disproportionately hit by COVID and the pandemic. Uh, this is the most urban region in the world. Uh, the, the ratio over 80% of habitants in Latin America and the Caribbean live in big cities. Most of them, these mega cities, six of the most important mega cities in the world are in the region. This region has a big problem that is mainly informality. So if you, if you combine urbanization and informality, there's no reason, uh, that's the reason why you're seeing, as pre recently pre ex-president Ricardo Lagos of Chile has said, this is putting back Chile 10 years. So I can imagine, if you imagine this Chile, the highest rated country in all Latin America and the Caribbean, imagine what that means for lower rated countries. So there's no surprise, and unfortunately, if you look at, even though we're only 8% of the people in the world, or population in the world, 40% of the new deaths are coming out of Latin America and the Caribbean. This gives a very strong indicator that the development role that we all have to play in the private sector and in the private sector has to be the North, has to be the reason why we operate. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for that, James. Uh, I'd now like to come to Scott. Uh, Scott, what trends are you seeing in the sustainable investing space globally during the pandemic? And uh, in Latin America in particular, in the Caribbean, what are investors looking for most right now to give them comfort before they invest? Yeah, well, thanks. I, I think it was uh, hinted at before, but I, I think in this case, it's really a situation of uh, investors really saying, well, let's not let this um, crisis go to waste. We were a little bit worried um, because we'd seen an exponential increase in investing in sustainable ways before the crisis hit. We were worried it might slow down some of that exponential increase, but actually I would say it's accelerated uh, interest. We see that from our investors uh, all over the world. And uh, you know, perhaps it's because it's really caused them to uh, think about the fragilities in the economic system in a new way uh, and think about the interconnectedness that, that everyone has uh, with one another all around the world. Um, so there's definitely an acceleration in interest in aligning investment dollars with, uh, with sustainable investments. And so it's, it's very good to see. And I would say too, I, you know, there, there's this nonstop sort of, as you mentioned, this nonstop debate about performance. Um, what does it mean for investors to invest in a sustainable way? Uh, you know, we think the right way to characterize it is that uh, a focus on sustainability issues uh, delivers better risk adjusted returns. So in some cases, it's because you're, you're, you're taking into consideration risks that otherwise might be considered non-financial, but are very material to the success of an investment. Um, but in other cases, it's because there's uh, greater opportunities, greater opportunities for growth for those investors focused on uh, sustainable uh, investments and sustainable development. Uh, so for us, you know, the people who, who, and most of the academic studies would suggest this, the people who say, well, you give up performance by doing that, it's only because they're focused, they either have a different time horizon, it's much shorter, or they're uh, certainly market imperfections that some people are taking advantage of when they invest. And that's generally uh, the reason why some people uh, might have those, um, those feelings. But uh, in the end, we would say, you know, a focus on sustainable investment, sustainable development. It's all about making the economic pie bigger, making it more inclusive, right, and more, more resilient. In the end, that's better for ec that's better economics. It's better for investors from a macro perspective. So we think the interest uh, in in investing in a sustainable way will really uh, continue to accelerate on uh, this this particular crisis as a catalyst for that. A couple of other um, observations about what we see happening as a result of this crisis. I mean, the the sustainable development goals as sort of the most important language of of sustainability for investors has really gone mainstream in the last couple of years, and I think it's it's taking a step up because of because of this particular crisis. And we've always thought that that's a good idea because there is, as you started out with your questions about, you know, there's a lot of terminology in this space, but there's something that we can all get uh, behind is the sustainable development goals and the language that comes from that. And certainly that's. Uh, it's great to see IDB has certainly embraced that in terms of uh, in terms of their uh, reporting and in terms of how they've integrated that into some of their um, their tools like their Delta tool. Another thing that we're seeing is a real acceleration this year, and this is directly as a result of the crisis, 
uh, just an explosion in the issuance of what I would call, uh, you know, they're not necessarily green bonds, just call them, they fall under the umbrella of sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, bonds or sustainable loans. So they're sometimes uh, called social bonds, sometimes SDG bonds, uh, sometimes, you know, COVID-19 response bonds, those types of things. But they all fall under an umbrella of, of sustainability linked uh, financial instruments. And we would say green bonds are a subset of that. Green bonds are now a trillion dollar market and still growing rapidly. Uh, but we think the overall uh, universe under this sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable uh, bond and, and, and loan universe can be much, much bigger uh, than the green bond universe. So that's, a, that's an important development really brought about by this uh, particular crisis. I think the other uh, thing that's happened is um, it's, uh, it's caused a lot of people to really focus on, I, I think, the other big ex existential threat that's on the horizon, which is climate change. Uh, it's the one that I think is best described as, um, you know, think about it as a pandemic that a new one that comes every year, uh, it's worse than the year before, and it never goes away. And that's what climate change will be uh, if it's not addressed, and it will impact our ability to, to do virtually everything else uh, and, and to invest sustainably in so many other things. So there is a renewed interest in really addressing um, those particular issues and making sure that that's part of the part of the building back better uh, and there's much much more investor interest in in aligning with that um, going forward uh, and lastly I think there's a there's a, a bigger interest to think about new new ways to partner together I mean IDB has been great about this events like this are an example of that but there's a new willingness to think about well how does the private sector interact uh, with different institutions uh, in the development world and with sovereigns uh, to truly, you know, really put uh, dollars to work uh, in a new way. And specifically, I think with respect to uh, Latin American and Caribbean countries, uh, what investors are looking for, I think, to give them comfort, as you as you suggested, is uh, is more transparency and better roadmaps. You know, it's very difficult uh, for anything to be sustainable. There has to be growth but there also has to be a sustainable uh, debt profile in the future. Those two things have to come together. Uh, and so, you know, that's what really will give investors comfort, that there's a roadmap to cause things to stabilize, to get growth back to where it needs to be to, to, to support even greater investment. And so that's why I think there's, you know, there's a real need uh, for those roadmaps to be created uh, and for them to be explained to um, the investment investing universe. And that, that could come from sovereigns, it could come from all sorts of uh, development institutions. And I think uh, spe specifically with respect to the opportunity uh, for investment in Latin America and Caribbean countries, you know, one of the new things the crisis has brought about is a very low return environment uh, if you're investing just in the developed world, very low yields and very low uh, expected returns from many equity investments too, because the growth profiles are going to be much lower uh, for a long period of time than we'd like. But that surplus of savings that's looking for a home uh, can find higher return uh, investment opportunities in Latin America. And we think that that, um, that differential that's developed uh, between the low return environment in, in the developed world and the better uh, growth possibilities and higher return environment in um, in Latin America will will make it easier to attract more investment. So um, that's why we think uh, you know it's an opportune time to think about these new ways to partner together, uh, to think about these roadmaps uh, for investment, and uh, and that could really yield some great um, some great wins wins for investors, wins for the local economies, and wins for development institutions. Thank you very much for that answer, Scott. And, and I must say, with my journalist hat on, I like that rather scary description of climate change as the sort of eternal pandemic that comes back every year worse than the year before. Um, a, a question now for, for Teresa. Um, we want to talk a bit about Brazil, obviously by far the biggest country, biggest economy in the region, so crucial to ESG investment. Um, while companies may be measuring and monitoring their ESG impact on a national level in Brazil, the narrative is, uh, to put it politely, rather different. Um, how can Brazilian companies cut through that Brazilian political noise? And uh, how's the pandemic changed how your company, BRK Ambiental, monitors and measures ESG? Okay, so thank you, Michael. 
Um, well, the, the three aspects of the ESG, the environment, the social, and the governance, corporate governance, uh, I'd say that's totally applicable to the Brazilian current situation. Um, as there are more than 5,000 municipalities demanding water and the sewage in a geographic area as large as the Europe. And the challenge and also the opportunities are huge. Um, Brazil is a country with 200 million inhabitants, but we are still struggling to make all its population having access to basic sanitation. Today we have 35 million Brazilians without access to potable water and 100 million, which is the half of our population, without access to sewage service. And the COVID pandemic put an additional pressure, pressure on the sectors of health and the social care where clean water available for everybody plays an important role against the virus propagation. And uh, recognize this immense challenge, the Brazilian government and the Congress approved last June a new law for those service. And this law, Michael, that enable a structured regulatory framework will create the required conditions to launch a robust cycle of infrastructure buildup. The Brazilian government studies shows that more than a hundred billion dollars is needed in the next 10 years to reach the, the universalization of water and the wastewater. And the, in parallel, the pandemic put the economy uh, under extreme stress and these new investments in infrastructure will be crucial to restart the Brazilian economy. So uh, from, from our side, from the BRK side, uh, uh, we are working uh, since 2017 when we assumed the company in all the three aspects of the ESG agenda. And I'm, I'm going to give you a, a brief example of, uh, of this agenda. On the environment side, we have a planting of seeding program to protect water resources, which is our core business, um, and uh, uh, to protect water resources and also the river habitat. And the last year we protected planting, uh, by planting uh, of seeding, an area equivalent of the Central Park in, in New York. On the social side, we have a broad investment program which has benefited 1 million people since 2017, including training programs for plumpers, men's and women's, promoting income generation across the local communities that we are serving and uh, environment education projects for students in the public schools. And uh, we are also on the social side, is stimulating social innovation by accelerating startups focus on the sanitation related, uh, related solution. And of course, on the governance, uh, we corporate governance, we implemented uh, very high standards of corporate uh, practice, especially a robust compliance program. And uh, uh, in 2019, it's the same as in 2020, because it's a recurrent program, 100% of our more than 5,000 employees from the top management to the field crew were trained in compliance practice. So we think that uh, this is not, this is something that needed to be in the central of uh, any company agenda. And uh, that's what we are really doing here in a very challenging, but also a very uh, scenario with a plenty of opportunities in Brazil. 
Thanks very much for that, Teresa. Now, if I could come back to James. Uh, just wondering, James, what you think is the downside of not having internationally agreed impact measurement standards? And, you know, with the rise of COVID bonds, which were mentioned by Scott, um, less rigorous regulations in some markets, is there a risk of social washing, do you think? Yes, I mean, we, we've heard a lot of what we call greenwashing and sustainable washing in a, in a number of different ways. And I think that's why, uh, as part of our sustainable investment approach, we launched what is called the risk management COVID guidelines and this impact management framework that gives an approach to how we look at investments. I think the lack of a good measurement creates confusion. Conf uh, today, we have a number of different stakeholders, in our case, our governments, but also communities, but a number of other investors uh, like Kimco and, and, and BKR Ambiental that have a number of stakeholders that are looking at the impact that our companies is having. So in that context, it's extremely important we apply the same rigor that we have to our financial performance on the environmental, social and impact investing. Those are the same. And, and hopefully this is becomes a general practice with all investors. I'm saying it because a number of investors are looking at it in different ways. So having a standard of how it is applied and the rigor is of utmost importance. Thank you. Um, well, Scott, if we could hear from you from the sort of CIO perspective, I mean, Europe, I think, has been seen as something of a leader in terms of reporting of ESG. Um, what does Latin America need to do to get to a good level of disclosure and transparency for sustainable investing? Uh, more, uh, just, you know, more, more disclosure and more transparency. And I, uh, you know, it's coming. It's, uh, it, you know, there are some regions of the world that are, are ahead. Um, but, you know, the good news is that uh, there's been a lot of progress in terms of people developing frameworks and sort of the common language of, of how to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's great tools. Like I mentioned, uh, you know, IDB's Delta tool is a great way for people to look at, measure, and, uh, and, and importantly, uh, continue to report on different uh, types of projects. But there's lots of frameworks that have been very well developed in the past few years that mean that people don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, when they're looking for different types of information. There's things like the Sustainable Accounting Standards Boards. It has kind of templates for more than uh, 70 different types of, uh, of, of industries. Uh, you've got the, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which is now has also a large body of templates and examples. Um, so both investors can go there uh, and, and issuers or people seeking investment can go there and see the types of things, see perfect examples of what uh, investors would like to see, uh, both uh, on an on a ex-ante basis as well as an ongoing basis. And so I think that's really um, going to make it much easier. And I also think there's a, a for, for Latin American Caribbean countries, I think there's a gr great opportunity uh, to take advantage of their voluntary, uh, voluntary national reviews that are conducted uh, through the UN and, and others to sort of lay out the roadmap uh, for investment. What the priorities are from the state budget, what they're seeking from the private sector, um, you know, and really help prioritize and guide investors into those, uh, into those, those places. So you know, we've been working with, with others to try to get um, both those national, voluntary national reviews uh, to outline those roadmaps for investment, but also to find it, um, you know, build a tool that makes it easier uh, for investors to connect with these opportunities and easier uh, for them to, to look at the wide range of possibilities, decide what really is, uh, you know, the correct investment for, for them and their investors and begin that conversation. Um, kind of the last observation is I think, um, you know, while I said more information uh, is, is critical, um, there is also, I, you know, we sort of sense the, the possibility that people are letting um, the fact that information is always going to be imperfect uh, get in the way of, of more disclosure and of moving forward. And we think that's a mistake. I mean, investors deal with uncertainty all the time. Uh, we're never going to get it right. We're always going to make forecasts and they're always going to be wrong. But the important thing is, you know, we're used to dealing with the imperfection. Give more information. Don't let uh, the, the, the struggle for perfection get in the way of moving forward. And uh, so it, we think if, if both, um, both issuers, those looking for investment, and other investors that feel as we do, uh, approach it uh, from that perspective, then it should open the doors to, to a lot more uh, investment going forward. And that's, uh, 
that's certainly what we're hoping for. Thanks, Scott. And just quickly as a follow-up, I mean, are, are there any countries or markets you'd single out in Latin America as having done a particularly good job on forcing better ESG disclosure? Well, you certainly see, um, you know, in the case of Latin America, I mean, I think there's there's some that have taken uh, big steps forward and some that have gone on pause, and, and understandably so, this crisis is really challenging. So, you know, I, I think it's easy to look for, as James mentioned, the higher rated countries generally have done a better job. Uh, but typically they have more resources employed uh, in that area. I guess we're just hopeful that um, that it broadens and it, and it deepens. There's certainly more that, that, that everyone can do uh, and not just the higher rated countries, but that's, that's typically been uh, the way it's been. Um, but, but there's plenty of room for, for everyone to, to improve. And, and as I mentioned, I, you know, as an investor, we're not, we're not frightened away um, from opportunities just because people haven't had the experience or haven't had uh, the ability to disclose in the same way that maybe their neighboring countries or, or neighbor, neighboring um, com competitive um, companies have had. Uh, because there, and, and the other thing I think that's been missing is people haven't had these templates. Right. Okay, so that's why we're optimistic, just saying there's so much out there now that it does, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of resources and it doesn't take a lot of creativity as it used to, as used to be needed uh, to bring your level of disclosure up to the level of those that are best in the region. Okay, thank you. And if I can come back to James now, I mean, we've talked about the need to build back better. What new projects and deals are you trying in, in Latin America and the Caribbean to counter the impacts of COVID on the region? Great question. I, I think we in the investment community have a responsibility to lead and show the way and I think if you look at the issuances that we have done, both IDB and IDB Invest in the market are all in the context of what we call social, social bonds or sustainable bonds. But let me focus on a few examples that we've done with clients. And I'm saying this because in the context of a pandemic, there is a lot of room to build back better. So a few examples. One, last week we issued the first performance-based incentive in gender bonds in the world with Banco de Vivienda in Colombia. Second, together with Banco de Guayaquil, as you know, Guayaquil has been one of the hardest hit cities in the entire Latin America and the Caribbean. And we work together with Banco de Guayaquil to enhance their program that's called Banco de Barrio. And in that context, we help them issue and guaranteed a social bond. Last but not least, uh, working with a manufacturing company, a textile company in El Salvador uh, called El Catex, so, uh, working with the supply chains to adapt their production to create more masks and more protection for social workers, health workers, to be able to be protected from the pandemic. So I think these are good examples of how we've worked with a number of our clients to be able to adapt their responsibility to be much more open and much more sociable. So I think in, in that respect, these concept of social bonds, green bonds, gender bonds are, are leading the way because we're attracting investors from within the region and outside of the region by using our very strong rigor and how we measure ex and exposed development impact. Thank you. I'm just curious, you, you mentioned it was a first, the gender bonds. Can you just say a little bit more about exactly what the gender bonds are and how they're different to what's come before? Sure. If there is, um, if you look at the financial system around the world, there is probably between 45 to 50 percent of the SMEs in the world are either managed or controlled by women but only less than 10% of those SMEs have access to financial services. That's why we, together with many other multinationals, have focused on women entrepreneurs as a way of bringing people out of poverty or creating opportunities for women. One aspect traditionally, you probably all heard about a lot is the microfinance business where in that area, something that has been created in places like Bangladesh and India, and has been working very successfully across in countries like Bolivia, Peru, Chile, Mexico, and others. That has been a very important tool to be able to access financial services for micro entrepreneurs, but primarily most of them, 90% of those are women. But there is a mi missing middle that is SMEs 
managed by women. And these have much less financial services. So when we think about a gender bond, when we think about that business opportunity, we're looking at a, a section of the population that today has less access to financial services. So we've got a measurement of what we call gender bonds and how we channel that money to women entrepreneurs to expand their own businesses. This is an example that we did with Banco de Guayaquil. We work together with WeFi. WeFi is a program being managed by the World Bank where a number of different donors have participated and given the World Bank the management of, of what we call concessional funds. And we created what is called a performance-based incentives in which we provide a bond to Banco de Guayaquil. And when they continue to increase their portfolio of women-owned SMEs, we give them a rebate with an, a lower increase, a lower interest rate. Why? Because we do believe, and we've seen around the world, that women pay better. So in that respect, we feel that this performance base is actually adapting the reality of the performance of these segments of the population. Thank you. Um, and just uh, one question for Teresa before we open it up to the audience Q&As. Um, Teresa, we've talked about how urbanized Latin America is, one of the most urbanized regions in the world. Um, do you think technology is going to help Latin America de-urbanize and create opportunities for smaller, maybe more sustainable towns or cities? Moot. So what I'm, I was saying, uh, Michael, that is that at the level of urbanization and uh, the way the cities are organized has a long historical evolution and a reason. And uh, in Brazil, we could say that taking Sao Paulo as an example, the government are looking to maximize the use of the existing infrastructure. And the, under this concept, the people has to live near to the jobs they have and where the existing infrastructure can be maximized, like electricity, telecommunication, water, sewage, transportation, uh, hospitals, and etc. And uh, this solution uh, can minimize the creation of a new infrastructure, uh, but uh, at the same time, maximize the use of existing one. And uh, as a long-term view, uh, the process to the urbanize, uh, the urbanize uh, make all sense for better quality of life. And the for sure new technologies uh, can have an important impact like remote, uh, remote work, schooling, remote health support as we are seeing right now during the pandemic. And uh, the sustainable cities uh, will demand the supply of uh, renewable energy, the proper discharge of sewage, the proper construction of ecological buildings and houses and so on. So in both cases of uh, urban policies, uh, government urban policies, uh, maximizing the existing infrastructure and the building up new sustainable cities brings a range uh, and demands a range of diversity uh, technologies that needed to be applied, improved, and some I think that still need to be developed. Um, just bringing to uh, 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 the sewage and, uh, and sanitation sector and uh, to BRK. Uh, we are working with the solutions to provide sanitation service to attend urbanized and not urbanized areas. We serve a broader range of municipalities, those with 2,000 inhabitants and those with 4 million inhabitants. And given the extreme, these extremes in number of population being served, innovation and technology uh, are crucial. Just to give you an example, we, not, we are implementing uh, treatment plants based on innovative technology that uh, take up less space in more populated areas 
as well as individual treatment plans for rural areas. And uh, we are also, and we also have harnessed technology to handle the disposal of sludge that's from uh, the results of uh, sewage treatment with, uh, it's a very critical uh, part of the treatment uh, chain and also a technology to reduce water losses that in Brazil reached the amazing 40% level. So uh, that's the way we see that uh, uh, technology can really support uh, small and large cities to handle all this challenge. Thank you, Teresa. Shocking figure, that 40%. Good Lord. Um, well, I'd like to come now to some of the questions. You've got some excellent questions. So many thanks to everybody who's attending the webinar for putting them in and do feel free to keep contributing. Um, I'd like to start with one from Ursula Salinas, um, who asks an excellent question. How can Latin America and the Caribbean attract more resources uh, to aid in the recovery when other emerging markets like Asia are recovering quicker? So, Scott, with your sort of global lens here at PIMCO, I mean, how, how does Latin America stack up here? You, you know, Ursula's right, Asia's growing much faster. Why should investors bother with Latin America? Well, I, you know, it is true, right, that, um, you know, for a host of reasons, um, many countries in Asia have fared better on uh, exiting the crisis thus far. Um, but uh, in many cases, the investment opportunities aren't necessarily as great. Um, yes, there's certainly some fast growing economies, but uh, um, you know, for, for global investors, right, diversification, don't forget, is also, also plays a big role. So yes, growth is growth now, it's growth in the future, but uh, doing, you know, as a big and large institutional investor, we're always looking for ways to diversify and increasingly investors will too. And investors, looking to invest in uh, developing economies, um, you know, won't want to cluster their exposure up in any particular area. So uh, I, I, I think there's plenty of room to think about the vast pool of savings that are trapped in low returning parts of the developed world and thinking there's room for a new wave of investment that goes not just into um, the countries that have been least harmed uh, in this particular pandemic, uh, but 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 realizing we will get past this, you know, maybe it takes another six months, one year, maybe longer. But on the other side, uh, some of the, the the faster growth potentials uh, in the world do reside uh, in Latin and, uh, and and Caribbean countries. Um, a lot has to do with the demographic profile, and when you think about that, that's it's very you know vastly favorable in most of the emerging market world, including many uh, Latin American countries. So that's part of the picture. Um, I don't think that uh, investors view this as, uh, you know, terminal damage for any particular economy uh, anywhere in the world, right? A lot of hardship, a lot of rebuilding, but just a tremendous amount of opportunity too. So, so I think it's, I don't, we, we don't see many investors, uh, for instance, saying, well, I'll only invest in those countries that uh, got through the uh, COVID crisis better than others. Uh, it creates new challenges, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of reasons that uh, investors want to, uh, want to take a diversified approach and not view it through the lens as this is a this is a, a pandemic that never ends. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you, Scott. Um, we, we've got an, another excellent question here from Alberto Linares uh, about definitions. And I, I'd like to come to you, James, with this one. Um, he's asking, you know, about how we really should define sustainable investment. How do we recognize that a particular investment is sustainable? And is there a maximum period for such sustainability to be considered as such? I would say that, first of all, sustainability, as it's worth said, is something that is here throughout the life. Uh, and that makes it important that this, whatever we build, whatever we invest in, it creates not only a do no harm concept, but particularly to create a positive impact on the triple bottom line, population, the world, and, and financial services. So in that respect, I would say that a sustainable investment is one that takes a comprehensive view of the impact that this investment is having and it creates a positive delta on that investment. Okay, 
thank you. Um, and we've got uh, a couple of uh, questions here which I can sort of put together about uh, countries, trying to identify countries that are best positioned for impact investment in a post-COVID scenario. Javier Agracia is asking about that and uh, Laura Hills has a similar question. So can one of the speakers identify three to five factors that distinguish the highly rated countries from the rest? What core characteristics set those countries apart? So where, where do we think the countries are that are best positioned for impact? Uh, maybe Scott, you could, you could help me with that one. Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting question without an easy answer in a lot of ways because where investors can sometimes make the biggest impact is sometimes in the places that uh, uh, are maybe the hardest to invest uh, and hardest for people to get their arms around, just requires more research. But that's where I think, you look, historically, I mentioned it's higher rated countries. Uh, if you just look at rating agencies, that's because they've done a better job managing their, their economies, their debt dynamics, and they typically have... Um, uh, institutions uh, that are functioning uh, better, everything from you know central banks to local municipalities and how they work together, et cetera. Uh, so there's a whole framework there that causes them to you know, be in a better position to provide um, clarity, transparency, and stability to investors. But that's not necessarily where you can get the greatest returns as an investor or where you can get the greatest or make the greatest impact. So I, I, I think, um, you know what I'm encouraging people to do on this particular um, on this particular webinar is to think about uh, you know going to, thinking about looking for those places that maybe they haven't looked before that might be harder to invest, but where they can have a big impact and where the financial returns might be greater uh, because there's just been less focus uh, and it's it's more difficult to invest um, from from the institutional perspective, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, inferior. In fact, it could be better. And that's where, uh, you know, partnering with, uh, with willing uh, and able institutions uh, that have so much experience and have the people on the ground like IDB is really powerful. And so that's, that's what we're looking to do. Look, look for those new opportunities that maybe have been overlooked because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're too hard to find or they've been too, too small. And so, or they've required partnerships, some sort of blended finance uh, uh, type of approach that, you know, it, it, all the pieces haven't been brought together yet, but that's that's where we think the big opportunities are um, for in, in the future, especially for investors that want to have uh, want to have impact and want to have the possibility of earning those higher returns. Thank you, Scott. And we've talked there a bit about geography. Um, there's also a question from Vanessa Sandoval about sectors. Which sectors would be key channels or instruments in driving sustainable investment? 